JP, thanks for doing this. <laughs> My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. So we were talking a little bit before recording about, about a lot of things, but we were about to get into something about improvisation. I guess maybe actually a good place to start is, is this app that you released, this web app. So tell people what the Rhythm Bot is, and then we can get into this um, improvisation stuff. Totally. The Rhythm Bot is created by Jamie Howard. This is a programmer. It has some of my ideas as well. We've worked together on it. And it is, at its core, just a random melody generator. And it was a sort of uncanny uh, moment where I had designed, I had photoshopped out a design for this app a year before he designed it. And then he basically hit me up out of the blue and was like, I made this app that uses some of your teaching curriculum to randomize rhythms and come up with infinite melodies, if you want. So we are trying to approximate something like flashcards <laughs> with rhythms. So, you know, you get one to four measures. You can set the complexity level. You can set it to triplets versus straight time. Got a bunch of other controls. And at the end of the day, you click the random melody button and it gives you some rhythm to play. In the context of my teaching, there are a lot of ways to you think about using it, but I'm also really excited to see how people think to use it in ways that I haven't, because that will surely happen. Totally. I played around with this app a little bit yesterday, practicing, and I think there's a lot of applications that I would use this for in my own practicing. And one of the interesting applications is for me to bridge the gap between this first learning stage and improvisation. So I might go through all of the permutations very systematically at first, but then you have the challenge of actually making music of that and having that come out in the moment as you're improvising. And you were just about to tell me something about your students. You had a handful of students that kind of managed to bridge this gap. What was, what was going on there? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, um, right. So the difference between or the gap between rote exercises, uh, like reading rhythms and recalling exact rhythms. And then on the, on the other side is, you know, the ideal sort of mastery of whatever the improv you're trying to do, where these things flow out of you. For the last couple of years, like my teaching is really centered around bridging that gap because I started uh, uh, recognizing in my students that especially the ones whose goal was to be creative and improvise, which is most of the students that come to me because that's what I tend to, to care about. Um, their issue I realized over time was, was not technical. It wasn't a speed thing. It wasn't necessarily even a coordination thing. It was an inability to think of rhythmic melodies that were interesting in the first place. So I like to think that any of you know your favorite drummers, they can sit and they can go boom, ga, ga, don't, don't, da, 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 don't, don't, da, 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 don't, don't. So they have this constant flow. And I kept having this weird thing with my students where, where it, it exemplified this difference between the two stages because I, I would sing them a complicated rhythm and they could play it. They could play it back to me perfectly. It's got fives in it, it's got threes, it's got sort of all this advanced stuff. And I'd be like, great, now think of one like that and play it back to me. Mm. And they'd fall back on the same old patterns that they were always playing. And this was to me sort of the the light bulb moment where I was like, oh, there's a difference between your listening vocabulary and your speaking vocabulary. Just like in any language, you know, there's so many words in books that I read that I wouldn't think to say in the middle of a conversation. It's just natural. But it's tricky because I think people's rhythmic vocabulary that they can create, that they can speak, it sort of flies under the cover of uh, what they can understand, right? When they listen to like a really advanced thing, like they're bobbing their head, they're like, I'm not, I'm not confused by what's happening. Like, this sounds great. Therefore, I must understand this. But understanding it is one thing. Being able to generate it, or actually, it's not even being able to generate it. It's, it's it generating itself by accident during your improv. Mm. That's the real goal. Right. So anyways... All that as, as the setup, as far as getting students from A to B, and then this eventually leads to what the app does, for me was everything has to be about melodies. It has to be about melodies from the beginning because 
me as as someone who is very comfortable improvising, and I think I can speak for anyone very comfortable improvising, whether or not you are thinking in melodies, right, melodies are constantly coming out of you without you trying to come up with them, right? So there's this constant flow of melodies like up here at the at the upper level, and then you're you are making decisions about how to deliver them to the drum set. So if that's the goal, like the mental experience at the end, then way earlier in the journey, you have to start think like uh, have precursors that involve thinking about melody. So everything has to lean towards melody. So when we think about, for example, uh, a paradiddle, one of the most common questions is like, how do I apply rudiments to the drum set? Right? These things are not transferring at all. Right? And so it's like, okay, with the paradiddle, what's the melodic element that we can start thinking about from day one? It's definitely like, so if you make the right hand melody stand out, drop the left hand to a ghost note, it's ba ba da da ba ba da da It's like, okay, now, the sticking now is just a way to get to the melody. And the melody is what matters because once the melody is in your head and you know what that melody sounds like, that's a much bigger piece of information, a more fundamental piece of information to learn. So you can take the sticking away now and go da 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 What's it sound like on the kick? Dun, 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 dun. Or I'm playing a samba. Right? So rudiments on as 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 means to get to the end of a melody. For me, this was key, and and I for me I call it the big ten. It's just a bunch of rudiments that we all probably already know. You have singles, doubles, inverted doubles, what I call the four paradiddles, just permutations of the paradiddle. Um some other stuff. Um and each of these, I, I just organize these ten groups of rudiments as uh, the ones that have the melodies that are most useful. So they're not necessarily the rudiments that you'd learn, that you'd use to like, you know, work on your marching technique and get your hand coordination like through the roof. But I don't care about that because almost none of my students' problem is their technique and coordination. It's this fundamental inability to think of interesting melodies. So those rudiments, right, on that list, and it could be anything. I mean, I teach it usually in a way like, uh, you know, we start playing these melodies, put the right hand on tom one, put the left hand on ghost notes, and you're just essentially developing right hand lead improv. Duke, do duke, do duke, do duke, do duke, do duke, you get threes in there, what I call dotted doubles, but you, eventually you work up to like fives, and, and that's sort of as, as advanced, complex as it goes. Um, but as you're doing that, right, you're developing the coordination, but more importantly, you're developing this ability to think of rhythms infinitely. That's kind of where the app comes in, because there's like sort of a leap of faith that needs to happen where you completely stop thinking of you know that pdf and those patterns and you just start flowing melodically and this is a very like squishy area because there's not like an exercise right that you do and then suddenly you're like just flowing melodies you know what i mean but um there's stuff you can do to make it more likely to happen and for me, the purpose that the rhythm bot serves is really to attempt to bridge the gap that you described, which is you're there. You're like making so many melodies, but you're also like thinking about patterns. So the next step with the rhythm bot is it takes the melodies that you've learned, right? These little chunks of melodic information, right? Da da da, da da da, ba da da, ba ba, right? And it's randomizing them completely now. So now you can you can no longer think in the like set boxed patterns that you came with, but you have all the tools to do these. So as you randomize, you know, and randomize and randomize, ideally what I hope happens is your intuition, like the subconscious vocabulary, expands and expands and expands. And so when it comes time to, to improvise at that point, you're no longer thinking in just like patterns you've remembered that have names, that's rudiment, you know, the paradiddle, you know, the right hand melody. It's become this like very integrated subconscious sort of activity that spits you out on the other side, ideally just thinking, thinking in melodies, free. One student specifically, like a couple months ago, we were like a year in, 
he came to me, he's like, I've never improvised a note in my life. Um, I've been playing exact transcriptions of songs for years, and I want to learn to improvise. And it was about eight months in doing the Big Ten. The app didn't exist yet, um, doing what I just described. And just to like try to give your viewers like an idea of what the experience feels like, he was like, JP, this has been a, it's been a big month since I saw you last. I feel like I'm able to get away from the patterns now. He's like, I have to focus really hard. I have to be present. But when I do that, melodies just come out. They're just flowing out. And I'm trying to decide how to deliver them to the drum set. Right? So there's really like, right. it's this very squishy, like ambiguous change. But it's something notable where it's just like you go, ba, ga, do, do, ga, da. And you're like, okay, like I didn't actually think about whether those were threes or fives or fours or whatever just came out right. but you could zoom in and think about it if you want anyways long answer to a short question but that's what the rhythm bot is that's the problem it's supposed to help solve <laughs> right 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 and it's i think a very important problem to solve so one of the things that it's doing is uh like you said it's rearranging these little chunks that you have already practiced in different orders and so what that's preparing you to do it is very similar in some ways to improvising. It's also different, but it has a lot of similarities in the sense that I believe when we improvise, and there are different opinions on this, but a lot of times we're not creating something completely new from scratch in the moment. We are rather taking things that we have played before and rearranging them in a new way. So to me, it seems like a randomly generated rhythm or melody is, is a very practical way to get used to, um, you know, getting in this flow state and being able to execute any of these moves at any time, depending on what comes to you in that moment. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Like, like you mentioned, actually, I think you mentioned this when we were speaking earlier before we started recording anything, but you're talking about like moving notes through the grid, you know, move a single note through the grid, move a double note through the grid. This is a very intuitive thing that people start doing. That used to be like really core to my teaching. And then it kind of dawned on me one day that like, because I always try to reverse engineer from my own thinking, right? And I'm like, uh, you know, in analyzing my own playing, I was like, I don't, I, I don't actually think I'm ever thinking about this in this way. I'm thinking about larger melodic chunks, right? So if you're going to move something through the grid, like you were saying, there's these chunks of information that really make up all the rhythms. So like, for example, da, da, da. Right, so moving that through the grid on the kick drum, for example, don do do ka, don do do ka, move it, don do do ka, don do do ka. That is so much more useful than moving a single note because very few moments in life need you to just go don ka, don ka, and you. Well, I mean, it is useful, but to move past that, the next step is to use these smaller chunks of melodic information. And like when you're saying like that's what it feels like to improvise you're not you know you're not inventing new rhythms when you play you're taking these chunks and you're, you're doing this and in the beginning i think you do have to do it very consciously you know it's like okay right. these are the items right for me they're the big 10 for someone else they'll be something else these are the items i want you to be able to to switch between like these four freely whenever you want you know and that's sort of like sometimes that's a student's first feeling of like okay well if i can do this whenever i want it's kind of like a proto-improv, you know what I mean? And it's like, okay, well, instead of four patterns, if you could imagine that they're just, you know, 50 patterns or little chunks of patterns, then you're basically, that's what it feels like at the end of the journey. Totally. Yeah. So I want to ask you something that might seem a little bit unrelated for some listeners, but I think we'll tie up back in here is um, I know that you have some experience learning French. You, you learned French and learned enough to go speak during your clinic tours. And I also find languages fascinating. And there's some parallels with music that I think are especially interesting in the learning process in general. And I was wondering if you've ever heard of the input hypothesis from Stephen Krashen. Mm -mm. This is okay. I'd love so, to hear it though. <laughs> yeah, so this is a, a theory about language acquisition. The idea is that when you learn a language as a kid, you're just immersed in the environment and you learn through input. 
you're not thinking about grammar rules. You're just getting a lot of inputs from your environment. And there's a long period where you don't speak. You're just learning to understand first. So the thing that this theory kind of presents is that we shouldn't be learning necessarily consciously all of these grammar rules and conjugation tables and, and that kind of thing. Instead, we need to focus on getting just a lot of input, and then the brain will kind of work out the grammar automatically just by hearing it a million times. And it's, it's a specific kind of input. It's not just anything. It has to be comprehensible input. So if you just turn the radio on in Russian and you don't speak Russian, it's not gonna, you're not going to learn Russian that way. You have to be able to understand a certain percentage, like 70, 80 percent of that, and then you can kind of draw conclusions about what the missing words might be. And so I've started to wonder in recent years how that might apply to music and how some of these things might just kind of happen through osmosis of like listening to a lot of music, um, but also maybe playing a lot of music. Because I think that's one of the differences with learning an instrument is that we have this, you can't just listen to music and be able to do it. <laughs> like you, you kind of can with a language to an extent. Like we have this massive physical barrier between us and the instrument or between the idea in our head and the idea on the instrument. And so we have to practice a lot to get our body to physically do that. And so I feel like that's, um, I mean, I don't have an answer on this, but I'm just curious if you had ever thought about um, in broader terms, maybe the, um, the role of, conscious learning versus unconscious learning and how that's all tied into improvisation. Yeah. I mean, there's so many cool little strands to, to go off on there. Um, I, I mean, there's tons, I agree that there are tons of similarities. Well, one of the things that you mentioned that is super key. I mean, there's two things that I think are really interesting. One's the subconscious element and the other is, the difference between, uh, uh, you know, like the input we receive from from speech, and the input we, we receive from the drums, and how they differ, and I think that actually the difference says something about um, wh why we end up, you know, acquiring language so much easier than something like drums. I think there's the physical element for sure too as the barrier, but I think there's something else. Um, the subconscious element, this is interesting. I was thinking about this just the other day. I've actually been just writing a lot about this stuff lately. And um, I was thinking about like, you can, to a large degree, think your way. Of course, this is not how children learn. But you can think your way to understanding a language. Sure. Right? You yeah. can just, just do enough mental work to get somewhere approximate, right? You have to, sure. your mouth has to learn to make the sounds, you know, there's some stuff that has to be figured out physically, but it's nothing like the, the, the barriers on the drums. Whereas in something physical like dance, I was thinking, which is very much like drums, I think drums is sort of like a very strange type of dance, there is no way to think your way to being an excellent dancer. Interesting. There's an intuition that has to be built up subconsciously. This is like your your muscle memory, your procedural memory. And to me, there's like a big aspect of, of what psychologists call chunking. You know, you're getting like more and more complex information, like depth of information in a single like chunk of information. So in the beginning, when you, when you learn a paradiddle, it's right, and then it's another piece of information left, and then it's two other pieces of information. But after a while, the very idea of paradiddle is one piece of information and you just automatically, it executes, right? That includes motor aspects, it includes uh, like the melody of it, blah, blah, blah. Um, so there's this physical intuition, right? I don't know what it is called, if it's a thing, but you know, you call it motor intuition yeah. that needs to develop. And I think dance is such a good uh, uh, example of it because, you know, a, a dancer can think of the a movement that he or she wants to make but like all of the actual execution is coming from this motor intuition. You just can't think your way through that, especially because it's happening so right. quickly. So it's, it's very much so the same on the drums. There's this enormous motor intuition element 
and when you think about again like i'm tr always trying to like analyze my own experience improvising to, to try to make it helpful for students there's so much less thought than one might think right you're thinking of a bunch of melodies no individual note is really even considered like in the same way that no word or letter I'm saying right now is really being considered. You know, it's like the idea is is you know appears to me, and whatever words I happen to have in me that will convey it will hopefully come across you know somewhat uh, convincingly. And it's the same it's the same with drums, but it all comes from that subconscious element. So it's like like you're saying is like there's I think in a different way from language, the since we can't think our way there, the the like physical mixing up of ideas is so crucial and this actually brings me to the other difference i was thinking between language and drums is, is when when we are learning you know when a young when a kid's learning english like they said like you said it has to be like they have to encounter comprehensible things but yeah. as they grow they encounter all of the English language that's spoken, right? Commonly spoken English language, right? The TV's on. There's a bunch of words they don't understand yet, but like they're confronting complex English in its entirety. Whereas with drums, we have a different situation where we learn a few basic groups. We might have some sort of elementary conception of how they're constructed. We might have seen them on a paper and be like, okay, like I kind of see how that works. But then we hit this weird thing where like we listen to songs and so often the songs are instead of like the world of rhythm, they're the same rhythms over and over again, right? Mm. They're dun, 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 dun. It's like the same dozen grooves in like 90% of songs. So this weird rut gets created that you end up having to think mm. your way out of at some mm. point. You know what I mean? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I keep I, I think of like a friend of mine told me who, who studied Indian classical stuff with with a, a great teacher for a few years he was like he was telling me his teacher told him like some Indian classical music gurus you don't touch the instrument for two years right? you just oh wow you just understand rhythm right you just understand rhythmic melodies all the ones that you're gonna need right so you can you can sit there and you can beatbox that do that that and then you sit down at the instrument and like the world of the language is already there you just have to figure out how yeah. to deliver it, which is the opposite of like how just, you know, your average sort of casual drum set player learn. They play to some songs, they play to more songs, right? I love the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Mm -hmm. It's like almost the same groove in every album and every song, you know? Yes. It, yeah, it, yeah. I don't love them any less for that. But, you know, it's like how much work did I have to do to like get out <laughs> of that groove, uh, literally, yeah. literally that groove? Um, but yeah, I mean, those are a couple of things that come to mind that I find sort of interesting differences, you know? Yeah, for sure. Is there anything else that has popped up in your psychology studies? So for people that don't know, you've gone back to school to uh, study psychology in addition to continuing to drum and everything else. But is there anything else you've learned in that environment that you find interesting? Is there anything like that that comes to mind hmm, hmm. you know there's definitely relevant stuff um kind of throughout that's why psychology is so fun to study because you don't have to try to make it relevant like everything is about the human mind um mm. i think the couple things that really stand out one is how much of of what you do is subconscious right and how much yep. of what you do is determined by the work you've done previously and that goes for everything, right? The beliefs you have, like what, what you were born believing and raised believing matters, right? So the, the grooves and melodies you were born reciting and learning and playing along to and hearing over and over again, those matter. Um, so the subconscious uh, and motor memory are huge for what we're doing, kind of tied to what I was saying a bit ago. Um, the other thing that I find most relevant to learning and this is this will make a lot of sense given what i described earlier as sort of the way that i think about teaching this stuff is this idea of chunking that i mentioned earlier and for those of you that aren't familiar with it 
uh, it's worth describing, and it's also worth describing why it usually gets sort of like overly oversimplified. I think it's more useful mm. than people think to think about, because mm. usually the way it gets conveyed is um, it's sort of a method to remember more things, uh, right? Our, our short-term yes. memory, our working memory, they say it has a limit of like seven things, plus or minus two. But if you make meaningful chunks of those things, right? The classic example is they read a bunch of letters and they say like X, F, B, I, C, N, N, uh, C, I, A, X. Like, did you remember all 11 letters? No, no one ever remembers it. And then you go, oh, well, look, it's actually X, uh, F, B, I, C, N, N, C, I, A. And it's like, oh, suddenly there's meaning. Now it's only three pieces of information. Right. It's the same idea. And that is usually where, where sort of like a uh, uh, discussion about chunking stops. But for me, uh, the, the more I read about it, the more I think about it and analyze what it, again, what it feels like to learn to improvise and to improvise at the end of the learning is that this phenomenon is so crucial to what we're doing. Like, you know, and this almost sums up, mm. you know, half of our conversation that we've had. I mean, mm. think about the, the chunks of information that you input are those items, right? My big 10, uh, the things that you'll encounter on the app. You know, everyone's got, there's only so many. So it's like da, 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 whatever it is, single note, single rests. Um, these little combinations are chunks and you rearrange them in so many ways that they become, that, that th the single chunk of information holds more and more and more information, right? And, it, and that includes the motor skills necessary not only to execute it in one way, but to put it on the kick drum underneath the groove, to put it over an mm -hmm. ostinato, to play it on the on double bass underneath like a quarter note hi-hat, whatever. Um, right, so that, it's just such a key thing. Mm -hmm. But there's a weird, there's a weird uh, sort of turning point, I think, mm -hmm. where, because for a while I was I was thinking about this and I was talking to like some students and, and friends about it and it, the, the experience of doing it isn't necessarily the experience of recalling very, you know, uh, deep chunks of information, right? So it is the learning process, but because that's the way that it was created, doesn't mean necessarily that that's the way that it feels on the other end, right? Ideally, there's just this flow happening, right? And if you could yeah. examine the mental experience super closely, sure, you'd have like these really rich chunks of information that have everything built in that you're sort of loose metaphor sort of rearranging in the way that we talked about. Right. But at the end of the day, it actually is a much more fluid process and you're zoomed out even further. You want to talk about this up, you know, so much being, you know, uh, procedural memory or subconscious, you're zoomed out even further and you're playing the, what I call like the art director role. You know, you're the foreman in the mm -hmm. factory. You're just sort of overseeing, making executive decisions like about the contour of what you're playing or about, where you're going to inject space versus busyness, right? You're deciding on the contrast, whatever it might be. Um, and really, it's to the point, ideally, not always, but ideally that, that the team beneath you, right, your limbs, are, they're just executing things perfectly together while you sort of like choose the direction. Yeah. Um, and when you, when you really think about that as the mental experience at the end, how much, is, how much that is subconscious about it becomes really wild. Yeah, you know, I mean, you're talking about dozens of notes in a second sometimes, and right. well, I think we can play that fast. Uh, lots of notes, lots. Yeah, you I know, think so. Fast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just it, it's so obvious that it's impossible to think about them as individual notes, which should really be a flag. And from the very beginning, everything has to be relevant to the end. That hmm. we're not going to end up thinking about individual notes. You can't avoid hmm. in the beginning thinking about individual right. notes. But quickly along the way, you want to start thinking about these, you know, uh, uh, bigger chunks of information, if you will, and all that, all that goes along with them. So yeah, I think totally. I think those are the two things that I'm thinking about very frequently in the crossover of psychology and, and drumming. Okay, and, and one more question in this realm here: What do you think about the idea? that I've heard a lot of musicians say before that when you're improvising, you shouldn't be thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think this is like a very 
like nuanced thing that's like often kind of glossed over. Like on one hand, mm -hmm. like that's a, a really noble goal, I think. Like no thoughts, that would be amazing. And it's yeah. just all coming out and just flowing and magical and all sounds yeah. great. On the other hand, like you spoke about this art director role and it seems like the, there are these little decisions. It's different than conscious learning where you're like really slugging through an exercise. But there is, at times, there can be some, some of these little thoughts and decisions. And uh, yeah. yeah, what do you think about that? I is love, it possible to... Yeah, so to me, this is another like, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a concept that's popular enough that a lot of people know it and have even read the book, but the concept of flow. There is, like, according to like the way that it's researched in psychology, flow is this total immersion state where your mm -hmm. level of uh, abilities is perfectly matched to the challenge, right? And there's, you know, you lose track of time. This is the complete immersion. This is what people are talking about when they're, you know, people who argue for that have, have experienced that feeling. And they've been like, wow, that is the goal and magic happens, right? Everything is just operating and you're not thinking, right? You're, you're sort of like attending, but it's like, it's also like meditation and presence. It's sort of those, one of those things where it's like, as soon as you notice you're in the flow, you're not in the flow. You know, right, you've right, just yeah. started thinking and you've ruined it. That right. to me is the goal. That's actually always the goal in, in pretty much whatever you're doing. The problem is that realistically, that is rarely happening, right? And knowing the basic uh, elements that tend to bring it about, right? That the challenge has to meet the, the abilities and simple stuff like that. Knowing where you've experienced it in your own life can help you just, you know, try to dial the knobs right so that you're more likely to fall into it. But since that is an elusive thing, and, well, since it's an elusive thing, you can't rely on it. So I like to, it's also not something you can teach. You, you really can't say anything about it. It just is happening or it's not. So in the realm of, of, of you know, <laughs> as a person who, part of my job is to, to try to teach and give advice there's very little advice to give there so for me i'm focused on the experience where you are present or i should say when you <laughs> when you're thinking when you're not in flow yeah. and the concept i like to think about here is focal distance and this is something mm -hmm. that when i describe everyone will will know what i'm talking about of like you your focal distance in, in the practice room, let's say, when you're really just in it, you're doing great, you're sounding awesome, is, is like in the perfect space, right? You're sort of overseeing things, like you're there, you might even slip into flow mode every now and then, but, but shit's mostly just happening. And then you have this weird experience where you, then you have a show that you're nervous about, you're on stage, and suddenly you're like really like, you're like, wow, like I, I don't know why like my kick drum pedal just feels so weird. Uh, and like, oh, my technique on this one hand, like my wrist is hurting, but right? you get like, you start zooming in on these crazy, like minutiae and it's way too close, the focal distance so that things start falling apart, right? You're paying attention, like the rebound on your kick drum for like the first time in your life in the middle of a show during like a hard <laughs> passage. It's just like, not the time, you know what I mean? And right. then there's like focal distance that's zoomed too far out, which is like you're literally just thinking about lunch tomorrow and just missing things in the song. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right, totally. Yeah. So somewhere between these is, you know, the ideal focal distance. And I don't think it's a place that you end up, but there's certain, you know, very like easy passages where you're, you're just laying into a groove and supporting the band. You can zoom out and you can like listen to the band and you can just sort of like be there and maybe for a second think about lunch. But then like a difficult passage comes, you might need to zoom in, right? Or like, oh, this is really a hard thing for specifically my right hand. So you might zoom in and just pay attention to that, da 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 And in that moment, right. you're not hearing like everything around. You're not zoomed out. You're not having like perspective. Mm -hmm. right? So you're moving in and out in this focal way. And of course, it's like an impossible, an impossible thing to like quantify. But you get the experience because everyone knows what this is like. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I mean, it's even like, if you think about socializing, you know what I mean? Like focal distance too close, you're like analyzing every word you say. And, you know, and then focal distance zoomed away too far out is you're just a total space cadet. You're not even like present with the people there. So again, there's something in the middle where you're aware of what you're doing, you're into it, but you're not overanalyzing everything. 
And I don't know if I have any uh, ways to manifest that sweet spot, but it might be helpful just to think about that depth um, for people and, and to try to figure out in their own mind how, if they start zooming in too far, because that's usually the problem, um, how they can create a little distance. You know, I've experimented with just like focusing my attention actually, if I start notice like my, you know, having one of those weird moments where I'm like, I can't stop paying attention to like how my wrist feels when I do this thing. Um, but it's not an issue. It's just like distracting me. I might actually shift attention to like something static. Or I'll look at like a wing nut on my, on my symbol. Mm, and that somehow yeah. removes me from like this thing that is like trying to pull me in and sort of like let that kind of have, I don't know. It's worth experimenting with, but that focal distance mm. for me is, uh, is what it's kind of all about. And, and if you find the flow, good on you. But it can be hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Well, I think this Rhythm Bot app will help a lot of people bridge that, that gap, kind of navigate these muddy waters. Um, I think it's super cool, personally. Um, like I said, I used it yesterday and looking forward to playing around with it some more. So JP, I know you're a busy guy. I don't want to take too much of your time, but it was a blast getting to hang with you. Um, anything else you want to plug or mention uh, as we close out here? Are, are you working on stuff with Childish Japes or what's happening? Yeah, Childish Japes is my band, has another album, our fourth album we're working on right now. Uh, and yeah, I'm always working on my website, jpbavetmusic.com. And yeah, that's it, you know? Just trying to do fun work with people I like and keep getting better at the drums. <laughs> right on. Well, I appreciate it. It was fun talking. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sean.